So we are in the right evening. It's May 22nd, 2024. That's good to know. And, oh, there we go. Okay. And so this evening's discussion is going to be Buddhist ritual and its role in Buddhist practice. A few preliminaries. The first is that it's not going to be a discussion about Mikyo. Mikyo is Tendai esoteric practices. Many people, um, when they think of ritual and they know about Tendai, they think immediately that's what we're going to talk about. Um, but it's not. <laughs> it's about ritual as a necessary part of Buddhist practice from the moment of bodhicitta to a seasoned practitioner. And there are those people who appreciate ritual and some find it satisfying, if not necessary. And then there's those who view ritual as an empty formalism. And it's not my intention to try to convince those who don't appreciate ritual that it's necessary, because I've tried to, given up trying to convince people of anything. <laughs> However, there are those who project upon Buddhism their own bias without reference to the teachings. And this evening's presentation is intended to provide an understanding of as to how ritual is important to human interaction and a very important aspect of Shakyamuni Buddha's teachings. And second, for the discussion, I'll be speaking as a Soryo, a Buddhist monk, and also as an anthropologist. In this case, the two fit nicely together. Uh, and I'm, this is going to be a relatively short discussion, so that there's plenty of time for uh, questions and answers. And also because sometimes we get so involved in the questions and answers that we forget that we got to go and do the service. So, uh, you know. Good evening, John. Um, so, let's. I'm not sure. Is that from, oh, maybe it's not on. That would help. Okay. There we go. Okay. There's a chair there, John. Um, to begin with, rituals rituals are biosocial evolutionary strategies. I told you it was going to be anthropological. The definition of a ritual is a ceremony in which the actions and wording follow a described form and order. A second meaning is the body of ceremonies or rites used in a place of worship or by an organization. And as an adjective in zoology, it's a set of actions that an animal performs in a fixed sequence, often as a means of communication. Let's see. Is it plugged on this end? Hmm. There we go. Uh, Too many. Um, apes, dolphins, elephants, crows, and many other stars of the animal kingdom appear to lead heavily ritualized lives. And this seems almost paradoxical. Why would such intelligent creatures spend so much time and energy on apparently pointless, this is from an evolutionary perspective, from a pointless activity when they could be finding more straightforward solutions to their problem, but this is actually the power of ritual. It's a mental tool that allows its users to achieve a desirable outcome through obscure means. It is the reason that intelligent organisms engage in these seemingly wasteful behaviors, not simply because they can, cannot help it, but because they can afford it. And this particular book by Zyklitis is uh, really, uh, I found it fascinating. So I, I'm using his, his uh, teachings in this. In other words, evolutionary theor theorists see ritual as a fundamental activity in an evolutionary process of many animal genre. One of the things I find interesting also is just in the last 10 years, zoologists have begun to look at animal behavior in very different ways than they looked at it when I was an undergraduate taking, you know, uh, comparative uh, ethology courses. And um, so we know today that uh, what you, one of the definition, definitions of a human when I was first starting undergrad was we make tools. But it turns out that everything from crows to um, even elephants and seals and whales make tools, you know. And so one, then it became, well, we use ritual. And you'll see that in a few minutes except that now we realize that 
a whole host of animals use rituals in all sorts of ways. I mean, elephants hold funerals for their deceased, as an example. So rituals um, are really common. Uh, the, in other words, the assumption here is if all these critters are doing it, it has to have an evolutionary function. It has to have been positive from an evolutionary perspective. Otherwise, one or two would do it, but not everybody, so to speak. And for social and biological anthropologists, it is thus possible to view ritual as a way of describing humans. And my findings as convergent discoveries from a variety of scientific disciplines reveal that ritual is deeply rooted in evolutionary history. In fact, it is as ancient as our species itself, if not for good, and for good reason. Although ritual actions have no direct influence on the physical world, they can transform our inner world and play a decisive role in shaping our social world. And this is where it gets interesting from our perspective. While many animals use ritual, none uses it as extensively and compulsively as Homo sapiens. In fact, archaeologists often consider ritual to be one of the core defining features of behaviorally modern humans contrasted to um, hominids from earlier periods. And it's related to the capacity for symbolic thought. The performance of collective ceremonies allowed people to set their everyday worries aside and be transported, albeit temporarily, to a different state. And as ritual must always adhere to a rigid structure, participation in collective ceremonies established the first social conventions for early humans. By coming together to enact their ceremonies, practitioners ceased to be an assortment of individuals and became a community with shared norms, rules, and values. And this is why anthropologist Roy Rappaport declared ritual to be human's basic social act. It is how society itself comes into being. And in fact, this may be in a, literally, in a literal sense historically true. By the way, Roy Rappaport uh, is an anthropologist. I'm not sure that, that anybody would be reading Roy Rappaport in their um, social anthropology courses today. If you see something by the anthropologist Roy Rappaport, Pick it up, read it. It may or may not be on point by virtue of what we know today as opposed to what we knew 50 years ago, but it's incredibly entertaining. <laughs> <laughs> so I highly recommend Roy Rappaport, if for no other reason than the fact you'll, you'll find it really fascinating. You, you might want to read something more modern to, um, to get a better understanding. So let's get into the origin of Buddhist rituals. To best understand how ritual was established in Buddhism, we're going to look a little bit at Theravada Buddhism in Sri Lanka. It's a useful place to start because it's there that Buddhism spread during the Ashokan period, 3rd century uh, BCE. And according to Kariwasam, the specific forms of ritual and ceremony in Sri Lankan popular Buddhism doubtlessly evolved over the centuries. It seems like this devotional approach to Dharma has a truth in lay Buddhist practice, even during the time of Buddha himself. Devotion being the intimate inner side of religious work, worship, it must have had a place in early Buddhism, and, and we'll be talking about that uh, in different contexts in a moment. But we know uh, one of the things that's, that's really interesting is that to put a little bit of context with this, when you think about where the Shakya kingdom, it was actually a republic, where the Shakya republic existed, is really on the border between Nepal and northern India in Uttar Pradesh. And at that time, as a kingdom, it was not a Hindu kingdom. It was a separate um, there was a separate religious system that was in that area at the time. Most people aren't aware of that. We, we associate much of Buddhism with, with early uh, Hinduism. But in fact, Shakyamuni Buddha did not come from a predominantly Hindu. Well, when you look at, at Nepal today, the practices of what they refer to, well, let me back up for a second. What we refer to as Hinduism is actually a misnomer. It comes from the Persian to mean the people over there. 
interestingly enough, because there is no solidified religion that is called Hindu. It's Vedic practices, Hindu practices, but it's not Hinduism in the way we think of, let's say, um, Christianity. There's a wide variety of Christianities, if you will, from Southern Baptists to Greek Orthodox. I think that they would have trouble recognizing that they were doing the same thing, you know, from a Southern Baptist church to a Greek Orthodox church. On the other hand, it is based upon a central figure of, of Jesus Christ, and so in that they share a common root, whereas Hinduism is highly localized. And it, and in fact, the caste system that was in the Republic where Shakyamuni Buddha lived wasn't even the same caste system that was found in India. It was a much looser caste system than is, was found in India, and it was reified much later around the time of the Upanishads in India. So I'm just putting this into context, when we talk about the rituals, Shakyamuni Buddha would have been part of at being a one of the elites there, aristocrats within the culture, he would have been doing rituals just as part of his everyday life. And so coming out of that, while it's often said that he eschewed all of Hinduism, that's sort of a broad gloss. He, because there were no Brahmins in his republic, Brahmanism was, was specific to other Vedic practices. So we, we have to put that into context that because people often project onto Buddhism, well, it doesn't have ritual. Shakyamuni Buddha didn't, didn't oh, many, I'm talking about in the West, many people, Europe and America, people will say, well, I like Buddhism because it doesn't have the ritual. And that's if they go to IMS or some other place. <clears throat> but Buddhism is full of, as you'll learn, full of ritual. And, and wherever you go in the world, except certain parts of the United States and Canada and Europe. <laughs> but um, so when we look at Sri Lanka, it's an it is a kind of um, looking in in a way to the past. Not to say that the Sinhalese customs haven't changed, the rituals haven't changed. Have changed dramatically over the twenty five hundred years, approximately, that Buddhism has been there. On the other hand. What's interesting about this is that the Sinhalese Buddhism in Sri Lanka, the Buddhism there, is much more oriented toward Hindu practices than you'll find in other parts of the, of, of the South Asian Buddhist uh, teachings. Although Thailand, I have to say, has an enormous number, of, is, has a great affinity to many of the Vedic practices also. And so some of the Buddhists share similar beliefs with Hindus, and as they worship Hindu deities, the caste system, animism, etc. In Sri Lanka, almost all the religious activities have a ceremonial and, ritual and real ritualistic significance. In Sri Lankan Buddhist rituals are classified under three headings. The first are, this is the first of the three headings, the first are the acts that are performed in order to acquire merit. These include offerings in the name of how of, of Buddhism, and they're calculated to release one from the cycle of samsara. The second are acts that are directed towards secure, securing worldly prosperity and averting natural disasters such as disease and earthquakes, um, and consider and forces of evil. Forces of evil, by the way, when we talk about that, up until the 19th century would have been healing ceremonies and especially in Asia most illnesses were due to evil influences when you look at Tibetan medicine there are four major books of Tibetan medicine only one of which contains information on how do you what pills do you use if somebody has bronchitis or what they would consider bronchitis. The other three books are filled with mantras and uh, prayers and that sort of thing to relieve the individual of the evil influences that led to the disease process, whatever it might, might be. And then finally, 
there are those rituals that have been adopted from their folk religions. And it's important to remember that the folk religions um, are certainly a major part of all of Buddhism, no matter where you go, um, throughout Asia, at least. So the most common daily ritual of Buddhists is that of the personal worship performed daily in the home. And this began in the late 19th century. Buddhist practices were associated with Sri Lankan nationalism. And it's important to realize that throughout South Asia, Buddhism is associated with that country's history of colonialism. And so practicing Buddhism and promoting Buddhist practices was a way to assert their equality with the Christian missionaries who were part of the colonialization process. Yeah. As a matter of fact, it's been said that in Sri Lanka, nobody meditated until the 19th century. Or they, had, they might have previous that up until the second century CE, but it fell out of practice. Mm -hmm. And so meditation had to be reintroduced to Sri Lanka and is reintroduced as a mechanism by which they were asserting their religious um, integrity. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, so the Buddhist practices were associated with, with Sri Lankan nationalism. And since the period following Sri Lankan independence from Brit Britain in 1972, Buddhist practices incorporated meditation. Buddhism is a state religion with over 70% of the population belonging to the Buddhist Sangha. On a communal level, ritual is observed at a temple or monastery, such as Poa days, set aside for birth, enlightenment, and death of Shakyamuni Buddha, as well as other commemorations. Lang writes that monastic libraries contain large numbers of ritual texts and ritual manuals. The performance of rituals is an important part of life of a Buddhist temple. And she goes on to say in some detail to describe the daily, weekly, and monthly rituals in Thailand, Tibet, Japan, Korea, etc. Praxis, including specific rituals and spiritual techniques, as well as generalized life ways, constitute a central dimension of all religions and is especially pronounced in the Buddhist case. This, again, is still lame. From the time of Buddha himself, Buddhists have devoted enormous energy to reinventing and developing, categorizing, and above all, participating in a vast array of rituals and practices while simultaneously attacking and or adapting and appropriating the practice of competing religious adepts. So what I'm saying here is that, that the very origin of Buddhism was accompanied by the origin of Buddhist rituals. It wasn't something that was, I, I think in the West we are given the impression, when you read many Western writers, you're given the impression that Buddhism is something that what came, and this, this is based upon another article also uh, by Prebish, but it's often written that Buddha said, no, we don't practice rituals, but the rituals came later were imposed upon Buddhism to meet the needs of the population at that time. And Premish was saying, no, that's not true. The rituals were part of Buddhism from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. you know? So let's go on to the elaboration of ritual in the Mahayana. <clears throat> As Buddhism evolved throughout Asia, ritual became increasingly important. Scholars of Buddhism, historians of religion, anthropologists, sociologists, psychologists, among many others, have generated a large, still open discourse on the role and meaning of religious practice in general, as well as specific religious rituals and, process, and practices. It's interesting that the Encyclopedia of Buddhism that was edited by Cohen and Akeon and Prebish considers meditation itself as a ritual practice. Further, they break ritual into sartoriological praxis, psychological perspectives, sociological perspectives, political perspectives, and aesthetic perspectives. The encyclopedia devotes one large section to the use of ritual in Buddhism. In a concluding section, um, it's written, one important way to unlock the unique significance of whatever ritual or practice one confronts is to remember that it is necessarily situated in, and therefore evidence of particular histories that coalesce to provide the context of its possibilities or existence. 
In tracing its roots, we discover not only what is traditional, common, and most deeply meaningful about it, but also how and why its performers have innovated in different historical circumstances. Hence, there are differences between Sri Lanka and Buddhism, uh, Sri Lankan Buddhism and Japanese Buddhism, etc. Um, even when a ritual or practice is literally repeated from the past, changing external histories given different meanings in each generation, such that the study of any particular ritual really is bottomless. Indeed, it is possible, even likely, that any single practice or ritual will have a vastly different meaning for different people in a single audience or even for a single individual at two different times. Philosophical study of Buddhism alone may leave one's capacity for ethical response untouched. Rigorous contemplative practices of Vipassana, Zen, higher Tendai, or Tibetan meditations are out of reach of many. And ritual forms have provided ways for Buddhists from all walks of life to become attuned to the same subtle dimension of body, speech, and mind that higher Buddhist philosophies and meditation engage. Rituals are used to memorialize the deceased shortly after death and at various times up to 50 years. Refuge ceremony is a ritual in which the person proclaims their adherence to Buddhist ideals and practices. Blessing ceremonies of various sorts connote the importance of Buddhism in people's lives. Daily rituals provide a framework for people to orient their lives in a constructive fashion and assist them in adhering to a set of constructive values. In Asia, visiting temples and shrines during various points in one's life cycle and during significant times of year, such as New Year's Eve and day, are a vital aspect of people's lives. Offerings are commonly made as a form of devotion. And rituals are not just part of a meditation, but are a meditation in and of itself. The Shoshikan and Makashikan of Chigi stipulates these rituals in a meditation manual, meditation manuals for lay practitioners and monastics. Even those secularized forms of Buddhism invent ritual to substitute for the traditional rituals that they reject. And I think that, that that's really important. And I've seen that at play. I, I, I taught at um, IMS um, for a number of years. And at, in, uh, oops, excuse me. Um, what, when the, that was, oh, I, I guess I stopped teaching there probably after Musong left there, because he would have me over there to teach sections on Chinese and, and well, East Asian Buddhism in general, because IMS is all um, West Asian oriented. Um, and um, the thing that I, you know, I would go there and I would teach a session, we'd have lunch, and then I'd teach a session, teach a session in the morning, have lunch, teach a session in the afternoon, be on my way for the evening. And, but I would usually get there early enough to join them for a meditation in the morning before I taught the first class and everything. And I was really surprised at how they had invented this secular Buddhist meditation-oriented organization, had invented ritual to replace the ritual that they didn't want to follow. <laughs> That's really what it came down to. I mean, they, they had a fair amount of ritual that went along with their, with their services. So ritual as integral to Buddhist practice. <clears throat> no dimension of human activity and culture was thought to be exempt from the impact of ritual. Ritual was understood to inform the human mind in every activity from social engagement to private reflection. And here I'm paraphrasing McCransky. Contemporary Buddhist practices and thought tend to de-emphasize the ritualistic and devotional aspects of Buddhism to newly material resources and strategies for personal and social transformation, which can be related to higher Buddhist philosophy. While this is important, there is a danger that contemporary Buddhists, by reinterpreting practices as a personal self-help, and social service do so exclusively in modern material terms that they dilute rather than reinforce the beliefs and epistemological intuitions of Buddhism, losing touch with the time-tested means for persons to actually learn to embody an ultimate source of response that transcends the assumptions of the modern secular thought. Ritual and in the individual practice assists in focus and continuity 
spending time each day at one's butsudan combined with meditation or not is an important way of tapping into our inner wisdom in order to meet the day's challenges. Ritual with a group, solidarity, a sense of inclusion is essential. If that were not so, Shakyamuni Buddha would not have included Sangha along with Buddha and Dharma. Anyone who is practiced by themselves only immediately notices the differences in practicing with others. A ritual practice with the Sangha into a collective consciousness that transcends the self. I told you this is going to be short. <laughs> so, in conclusion, a ritual is the enactment of myth, and this is according to Joseph Campbell, and by participating in the ritual, you are participating in the myth. And since myth is a projection of the depth wisdom of the psyche, by participating in a ritual, participating in the myth, you are being, as it were, put in accord with that wisdom, which is the wisdom that is inherent within you some anyway, anyhow. Your consciousness is being reminded of the wisdom of your own life. And let me remind you that here, Joseph Campbell's use of myth is a narrative of reality that goes beyond the modern use of the historic. It's an experiential realization that tells an important story and thus is passed on to others. Religious ritual is a way of, of structuring time so that we, not employers, not the market or the media, are in control. Life needs its pauses, its chapter breaks, if the soul is to have space to breathe. That's according to Jonathan Sachs. If you have read Jonathan Sachs, you'll be, appreciate his, his works. This brief primer on Buddhist ritual is intended to provide a perspective on why it is important in our daily lives and our weekly gatherings. And we have here some of the works that I used, though not all of them, on, on ritual. Um, the one that's by um, Zagladius, the last one there, Ritual How Seemingly Senseless Acts Make Life Worth Living, is one that I highly recommend, by the way, as, a, as an overall uh, introduction to ritual. It's current. You'll see Rappaport there, Ritual and Religion, the Making of Humanity. Um, the Roy Rappaport, by the way, just to go back to, to Rappaport for a moment, um, did some incredible work on early Buddhism in his anthropology, looking at at um, Japan, uh, looking at Japan, looking at India and the, the Indic continent at the time of Buddha. So that that work is really worthwhile. That's not necessarily the one on on ritual and religion. I can't remember the name of that particular work, but he did a fascinating study on looking at India. <coughs> Um, at the time of Shakyamuni Buddha, that gives you some real insights into that. And now, we will go, I, I love this picture. <laughs> <laughs> so, what questions or comments might we have? Uh, uh, the, hold, hold on, Ichishima Sensei, do you have any, any comments you would like to, to make mm. first? Well, thank you. Uh, generally, in Japan, we have uh, the two types of rituals. One is exoteric, the other esoteric. And uh, exoteric concern the uh, um, seasonal uh, greetings, New Year, or Ohigan, Obon, etc. And the esoteric, we actually uh, do the fire ritual ceremony at Tamoing, Bisha Mountain, uh, twice in a year, and uh, summertime and uh, uh, New Year, and we are going to have summertime uh, that is twenty seventh around Saturday uh, at the Tamoing Temple, offering fire rituals. But rituals really, uh, I think, are important to consider our <coughs> and the um, so. We do esoteric, we do that uh, showing uh, mudra and mantra and mindfulness, etc. 
body, speech, and mind. This is uh, the expression between object of worship and uh, uh, personal self. And when we meet together, then it really brings happiness. This is my impression. Thank you. Thank you, Sensei. Um, and, and just a reminder, we're going to be doing the Goma here on uh, June 9th, on the Saturday, June, or Sunday, June 9th at 2 p.m. And this month's Shingi, I am writing a piece about Mikyo, about esoteric oh, wow. practices. Awesome. So I thought that would be a good preparation for the Goma. Yeah. Um, so, what questions or comments do we have? Oh. Yeah, briefly, I'm going to stop the recording. And